Did you ever wonder how a stringer's technique can affect the overall string job, especially stringing on a lockout machine? In this video, I'll share with you how to streamline your technique and maintain consistent tensioning. All right, let's go inside. Locked out? No worries, I got the key. If you're an old timer like me, you probably learned how to string on a lockout machine like an Ectalon H or maybe one of the previous models. Now when I say old timer, I mean this is before electronic machines. I learned on an Ectalon D model and over the years it's been updated and today it's called the Prince Neos 1000. And during those years when it was updated, uh, the stringing clamps have changed, the mounting system has changed, but the tension head mechanism has pretty much remained the same. When I first learned how to string, I was taught to always bring the tension head as close to the frame before tensioning each string. But then eventually I got an electronic machine, and then one day I was thinking, what if I position the tension head in a fixed position, like a constant pull machine where the tension head starts from the same point, and what if I started the tension head from a, a farther distance from the frame? Would that affect the overall tension on a string job? So I was curious, so I decided to experiment. All right, so in this experiment, I'll be stringing this racket three times using three different methods of pulling tension. And as I mentioned, I'll be stringing one with the tension head as close to the frame as possible. Uh, and the second one, I'll do it uh, as far away as I can possibly uh, position it on the track. And then the third, I'll show you the, uh, what I think is the most optimum way to pull tension. Now before each stringing, I will be cleaning the clamps to ensure accuracy. And I'll be stringing it at 50 pounds. And the strings that I'll be using is uh, some skirt strings I got lying around, but it's this Prince Tour 17 polyester. All right, let's get stringing. All right, so as I'm stringing this first uh, racket or the, using the first method, I'm gonna take note of how close the tension head is to the frame on each pull and kind of get a feel for where it's at. So like in this case, when you're in the throat area, uh, well, this one's not too bad, it's about three inches. I think when I measured, when I measured the other side, it was about four inches. So uh, I'm gonna just kind of see where the tension head is in relation to the frame. So like on this, this other side, if you'll, if you'll notice, I can get it up to about less than an inch. So it's uh, this gap right here. So I'm gonna um, take some readings as I'm stringing this racket and I'll come back to you at the end. All right, so I just finished stringing this racket with method one. Now that gap between the tension head and the frame varied from an inch to as much as four inches. So I'll go ahead and take the uh, ERT reading first and see where this one comes in. All right, so this one's coming in at 40 and I noticed my battery's getting low, but uh, I'll go ahead and take a uh, RDC reading and I'll take two and three if necessary. All right, that first one came out at 39. Okay, I got a 40. And a 40, so I'll go at 40 on both the uh, RDC and the ERT. All right, so in the second method of pulling tension, I have the tension head set about six inches away from the frame, but in situations like this where I'm in the throat, uh, I'm about seven and a half inches away from the frame. And so I got just enough track here to pull tension for each of the strings. I'll go ahead and again measure it to make sure um, I can give you that uh, the difference in distance. But right here, uh, yeah, this is right at six inches. So this is probably going to be the average right here in terms of the uh, amount of string length that's going to be between the tension head and the frame. All right. So before I install the crosses, I thought it'd be interesting to take a reading using this uh, string meter, and it has a free string scale. So what I can do is actually measure 
what the mains are before I install the crosses. So I already did the uh, first racket and I'll put the uh, uh, numbers up, but I'm gonna go ahead and just measure the uh, four center mains starting with the left uh, and then kind of work my way off to the right. So I'm gonna just do it a couple of times and just make sure I get a good reading. So this first one I got a 33. And this is uh, the first main on the left. So on this one I got 32. Okay, that one I got another 32. And this one's coming in at 32. So I'll put those numbers up and um, I'll go ahead and measure this also on the third racket that I'll be stringing. And uh, yeah, I'll install the crosses. Let's see what's gonna happen after I take a reading when I'm done. I did wanna mention that although it feels kinda odd for the tension head to be this far away from the turntable, one good thing is that I never had to worry about the turntable hitting the tension head because it's so far back. Now, if your machine has a turntable that goes 360, that wouldn't be an issue, but you can see that for each pull, I'll bring the handle over on this side, uh, I only have to turn it about a quarter of a turn. So every time I tension string, I'm only turning it about that much. Well, that went a little bit more than a quarter, but it's definitely not even a half turn. So for each uh, each tension string, uh, I'm not moving this knob very much, set in this position. All right, readings on racket number two. So when I measured the distance between the frame and the tension head, it varied from six to seven and a half inches. So it was just an inch and a half difference from uh, pole to pole. And um, remember I did the uh, free string scale reading and uh, it did come up a little higher. I did an average and um, with the four center mains and the first one it came out to 31.50 and the second one 32.25. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a ERT uh, reading on this and remember the first racket red uh, came out at 40. So this one's coming out at 42. So that's two uh, pounds tighter. And on the RDC, the first racket also came out at 40. So this one's at 42. This one's at 41. And this is at 42. So I'll go at 42. So we got 42 here and 42 here. So now we're gonna get into the third racket where I'll uh, show you what I think is the most optimum way of tensioning on a lockout machine. So earlier in the video, I mentioned that it was after I got my first electronic machine, which is a Babolat Star 3, that I started to think, why couldn't I apply the same principle on a lockout machine? And what I mean by that is the tension head so you'll notice that even though this is uh, not the Star 3, what's uh, similar about all constant pull machines is that the, it's, a stationary, it's a stationary position. And then from there, you'll apply tension going back. So uh, what, I, what I have is the racket mounted here, but I wanted to see what would be the uh, average in terms of uh, distance between the frame and the Diablo, since that's where tension is going to be applied from that point on. And um, it kind of varies from about six to about seven and a half inches. Uh, I think this was the closest point. Yeah, right here, six inches right here. Uh, and the farthest was right around here when it reached this uh, corner right there. So yeah, it was about seven and a half inches. So in my opinion, part of the reason why a um, lockout machine comes out less is because of the distance that's uh, uh, between the tension head and the frame. But you could see how on the second method where it did come out tighter because of the fact that it was further away and it was basically pre-stretching more string uh, between the tension head and the frame. So on this third application I'll show you will be, uh, I think, 
uh, combining the best of both worlds. All right, before I start the third method, I did want to show you that I had the tension head previously about this far away from the uh, top riser. So what I'm going to do to start off before I even pull the very first string is I'm going to disengage the tension head by uh, bringing it off the track and just bringing it up so it clears the top riser. So you have just enough space here so that it all is clear. But the other thing I'm going to pay attention to is making sure that this knob is at 12 o'clock. So if your machine has a handle that doesn't come off like this, all you have to do is just uh, make sure that you rotate it around. Uh, again, I'm disengaging it from the tension, um, the track, and just make sure your knob is at 12 o'clock. So every time you string, you're gonna always make it, make it a point to, I mean, every time you tension the string, you're gonna uh, pull tension from this point on back and then return it up to 12 o'clock. Uh, the problem I was having sometimes when I was going close to the frame is that you would pull a string and sometimes you wouldn't bring it back all the way and then you would end up uh, you would end up hitting the tension head so or maybe you would crank it so far back to make sure it clears but uh, to me that's not efficient you want to make sure that you're really uh, uh, really efficient in your movements so um, so I have it set here and again if it's a machine that it can, you're your machine can go 360 without hitting the uh, the bottom or the top, then I would just set your tension head about three to four inches uh, of distance between the frame and the tension head. So I'll go ahead and pull a couple of strings and then show you what will happen. So I'm going to pull tension from there. And so I, when I bring this back, I'm always going to just return it there. And I, I know that it's going to clear no matter what. So, uh, and I'll go ahead and do this one in the throat because this one's kind of tricky sometimes when you have to pull it in here. You can get this through the hole. All right. So, so I have it right here, but I can reach it. I mean, I don't have to move it forward or back. Uh, I, so... It's good right there. And return it at 12 o'clock and it works right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish the rec uh, rest of the mains and we'll take the uh, free string, um, use the free string scale to figure out uh, what the readings are on the mains. All right, so I just completed the mains and I'm gonna go ahead and take some readings using the string meter again. And this is on the four center mains, starting from the left, the second from the left. And I'm just doing it a couple of times just to make sure I'm getting a good reading. So I got 33 on that first one. Okay, I got 33 on that second. Okay, that one's 32. And that one's 32, so I got two 33s and two 32s, so that'll average out to 32.50. So it's slightly higher than the second racket that I strung. So I'll go ahead and finish the uh, crosses, and uh, I'll show you something on the crosses though. All right, so I wanted to show you something here because again, I was talking about how you wanna be efficient in your movements. So I have the tension head here with the crank, uh, knob at 12 o'clock and I'm gonna go ahead and tension this cross string here and you can see that this only went down a little bit more than a quarter of a uh, rotation um, of a turn there so I'm gonna go ahead and clamp off this string but again I'm just bringing it up to here so all I'm doing is moving the tension head from here to here and I'm not messing with trying to crank it up close to the frame and of course I'm not cranking it from further back. So again, when I said combining the best of both worlds, uh, that's what I meant. And also just the fact that you're always pulling from the same distance, I think you're applying the uh, principles of a constant pull machine, which to me made sense. Uh, after I got an electronic machine, I could see how that would be uh, something that would be, uh, that would help the consistency. So there it is, there's another string. Um, I did another video where I raced myself and I did um, the uh, electronic versus uh, manual. 
So if you take a look at that video and maybe pay more attention to the manual one, you'll notice that as I come right into the, uh, after I weave the string, you know, I'm bringing it right into the uh, tension head, but you know, there's no way that uh, I'm ever gonna make a mistake if I just go right through it, bring it up right there. And then, uh, you know, I can just move the machine as fast as I want because I know it's not gonna hit. And um, so anyway, that's one way you can make your movements a little bit more efficient when weaving the crosses. Well, while I'm finishing this uh, third racket, and uh, I wanted to just share a couple of things. So this, this technique that I use with the tension head set in this position is something that I teach all my students when I'm uh, teaching them usually on this machine. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think you can, you can apply it to any uh, lockout machine. Uh, the other thing is, uh, <laughs> I tell my students, when you can string and actually talk to someone, then you know you reach the, the, a higher level of stringing. And then the next level is when you can string and set yourself in one position and set up a TV and be able to watch TV as you're stringing. I find that a lot of students at the beginning will go around the machine and start moving their bodies around the machine. But um, really what you wanna do is stand in one spot. And if you had a, a constant pull machine, of course, you know, it'll stay and you just uh, have to stand at one position. But um, this Eton, I'm sorry, this Neos 1000 actually has a set screw at the bottom and I'll provide a picture. And if you loosen it, you can actually move the track. And there's some stringers that um, I guess they prefer to have it just stay in one spot, but, um, and that'll help you stay in one spot. So let me just uh, read this string and see if I can take advantage of that feature. So uh, I'm not sure if it was designed to be uh, moved in that fashion. Um, I always did it because uh, I just found it out. I found out about it, but uh, on my own. But let's say you're right here and you're clamping off here. So, um, okay, well that wouldn't be the right situation. Let me see if maybe uh, I can come here. Okay, well I'm on my last cross. I might not even have to use it, but uh, maybe I might just have to create a situation. And, um, Show it, show it to you. All right, so. All right, so I'm gonna tension here. And. All right, so, but let's say if you did wanna move the machine in some way and you had to get on this side. So you can actually move it and not have to walk around it. So anyway, a uh, quick tip on that, uh, that set screw at the bottom of your uh, turntable. All right, so racket number three, remember the, the tension head was between three and four and a half inches. So similar to the second method where it was six to seven and a half, there was that inch and a half uh, differential in pulls. So I'll go ahead and let's take a ERT. Reading. All right, so it's coming in at 42, which is similar to the uh, the second racket. All right, so we'll take a RDC reading. Okay, I got 40 on this first one. One and 41 so we'll go with the 41 on this so it didn't come out as high as a second racket I mean that's just one unit so uh, but you could see that uh, it matched the tension on the ERT but the bottom line is that um, yeah if you're gonna string on a lockout machine you want to make sure that your technique and pulling the string is consistent. And whether it's uh, six inches away or three inches away, 
I think you're gonna get better results than just going up close to the frame um, each time. In case you were wondering, I did post a previous video with the same exact title. I actually filmed that two years ago and posted it last year, but I felt like in this video, I was able to go more in depth, uh, explain the rationale behind the technique. So if you did see the other video, I hope you like this one better. If you haven't seen the other video, well, you don't have to watch it. Thanks for watching. Happy stringing. And let your strings play.